Loughborough University research has impacted every major tournament football since the 2004 Rotario in Portugal and we're still working with Loughborough as we head towards 2026. The kick and robot here at Loughborough University has been replicated in our lab at Adidas and we routinely use it for all football and football boot development. Our work together led to a pattern on surface features to aid aerodynamic stability that was included for the first time in the 2010 World Cup ball. Our tomographic particle image velocimetry has really shone a light on the complex vortex shedding that takes place in the wake of a ball in flight. Our detailed analysis of the impacts that last only a few milliseconds has revealed how some of these materials behave under rapid loading. This has supported the development of football products that perform under massive global scrutiny. Um, thank you, Professor Harlan. Uh, let's move on to our next topic, which is the FIFA World Cup footballs and technologies impact. So drawing from your experience working with FIFA on World Cup footballs, in what specific ways has technology influenced the design and manufacturing of these footballs? And more broadly, how has this technological impact translated to the game itself? Yeah, really, another really good question. Um, so I've been um, involved with, with the development of footballs for some, some time now, actually, um, over 20 years. Um, and, and if I think back to the sorts of uh, footballs that were used 20 years ago, um, these were generally... They, I'm not old enough to remember really the the, the leather balls that, that people used to play in back in the day, but these were synthetic um, balls made from um, sheet materials that were then stamped into typically hexagons and pentagons. And if you want to get into the mathematics of how you could arrange different shapes into spherical objects, there's a whole world that you can get lost in there. Um, but effectively, um, a, a truncated icosahedron um, allows you to assemble 32 panels, so that's 12 pentagons, 20 hexagons, um, uh, into a spherical um, uh, object, um, actually based around carbon, um, the carbon-60 atom um, is, 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 is the sort of most efficient way of arranging 60 nodes um, in, 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 in that way. Um, and so what that meant was you were producing sheets of material, you were stamping out, you were punching holes around the edges for the stitching, and then you were sending it away to be um, manually stitched together. So all, all, all the elite level balls used in the World Cup were, were hand stitched up until 2002. And so um, what the project I was involved in um, with Adidas really um, was to initially to, to, to explore how new materials, new manufacturing processes, new assembly methods, um, which would allow the ball to be made without manually stitching the panels together. So effectively gluing and, and, and bonding the balls together. Um, and really how, if they're gonna make that change, how can, what tests uh, and, and measurements need to be put in place to make sure that the ball still operates like a football so that when the general public are watching the games and when the players are playing the games, they're not saying, whoa, 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 what's happened to this football? We can't play with this. So in a sense, it was it was massive changes wanted were needing to be made. And there were lots of drivers in the background that hidden behind those. So, you know, manufacturing efficiencies, the amount of um, air miles that the balls were having to to to, to do and, and and so on, and the control over the designs that that um, the manufacturers were able to bring but in some respects they 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 yes they were wanted to improve the game um, but they definitely didn't want to make the game worse and so a lot of the tests that I was uh, involved in developing and a lot of the computer modeling that we were doing of that of the ball was to um, basically expose the ball to uh, extreme situations um, and monitor how it performed in those situations because you know the last thing you need is um uh you know the penalty of the world cup final that's going to decide the winner um and and the player you know hits the ball in a particular location on on its surface that causes a a, a deformation that's um asymmetrical and the ball veers off to one side and things like this and now to some extent the player Nobody will ever know that because it, the player would just look a bit silly. <laughs> and that's a bit harsh if it's not the player's fault. <laughs> and so so a lot of the work that we were doing was how do you measure consistency of footballs? How do you measure the uniformity of footballs? 
at that time there was there was a, a change as well, which you guys probably won't realize that that a lot of elite level football matches before then were played with one single ball. And if it got kicked into the crowd, it got it got returned. So the players could get used to the ball that was being used in that match. Whereas obviously now um, a ball goes out of play and a different ball is thrown back into play. And so the, ability, the, the need to make sure that there was good consistency between balls was quite important because, again, the players would notice small changes if the next ball that came on was was different to, to the one before. Um, so yes, we, we we did a lot of work on 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 the, what I would call the mechanics of the ball. So the way that it deforms, the way that it stores energy, the way that it returns the energy, the way that it flies off, how consistently that process um, uh, works. So we we built ourselves a kicking robot. So this robot can kick the ball the same every single time, much 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 more consistently than any player can. So if we kick the ball a hundred times and we have a hundred locations on the on, on the target um we can see how they are distributed um we can see whether ball a or ball b or another ball from a competitor um has a tighter or broader cluster of points and so we can objectively assess how consistent the ball would be then we could we went into the process of extending the ball uh, extending that range further. So obviously when the ball flies through the air over a distance, then the aerodynamic forces start to affect whether it's going to veer left or right or up or down and so on. So we, we we ended up putting a lot of footballs through the wind tunnel here at the university, which is generally being used for um, automotive and aerospace applications. But we managed to persuade some colleagues that footballs were interesting as well. And so we um, were, you know, we we're able to take measurements of the aerodynamic performances of the ball. So as we change the seam arrangements on the ball, it changes the aerodynamics, the way the air flows across it. And so you get these um, ever so slight effects that will, will, will the players will probably notice. Um, sometimes they're pleased about that. Sometimes they're not so pleased. Often the strikers have a different opinion than the goalkeepers, which we've just got to live with. We're not going to be able to please everybody. Um, so yeah, um, mechanics of the ball, aerodynamics of the ball, um, one or two other um, bits and bobs about um, the surface of the ball and what happens when it's wet and when it's dry and how does it interact with the boots and the pitch and all of these kind of things. Um, so yeah, it's been a really, really interesting and exciting uh, journey. Um, it's still going because the ball's constantly changing. So you'll probably be aware that in the most recent tournaments we've had... Um, uh, uh electronics in the ball to help with the decision making um and that obviously changes or has the potential to potentially change um the way the ball is is behaving because there's now physical additions so part of our job is to assess um whether those additions are making a noticeable effect on the way the ball behaves or not and maybe make recommendations as to how we can include those electronics without um impacting the game and so on. so I think you know there's lots of factors that have that have meant football has has changed. I think most people would say positively in terms of the, the game on the field, the, the the quality of the surfaces, the the, the quality of the footwear, the, the the consistency of the balls. You know, I think a lot of those factors are now meaning that the most skillful players are able to exhibit their skills in a way that impresses us all and gets us all really excited. Um, so maybe you know making the ball, helping to make the ball consistent um, has played a very, very small part in that. Um, but uh, yeah, we, you know, we'll, we'll see how things progress into the future, but, but that's, that's what it's been like so far. Thank, thank you, Professor Harlan. You know, um, it's quite actually intriguing for me because there are so many factors and mechanics to the simple, just a ball, right? and things like aerodynamics and the way it's stitched and so on, which is not seen by everyone. You know, and it's not so obvious to the common person, but it still plays a crucial role, like the penalty example you mentioned. And as a soccer fan myself, I support Manchester United. So the focus is more on winning than seeing the evolution of the game, right? So you know, these, things, these kind of things is much, very interesting for me and I, can, and I can't imagine the controversy surrounding. Thank you for shedding light on the technological advancements in football design.